What's the deal, my people? You know it is Don Tony Teflon, and I'm back at you another one. And this one is the Changeling episodes one through three recap, review, and ending explain. I will go through all of this in this video. I'm really excited for this show. To me, it opened up great. I can't wait for more. I'll be doing live streams where you can call in, speak to me live on the air, and give your theories and opinions on this show. So let's break down and recap the first three episodes. The first episode of season one of The Changeling opens with a narrator reaccounting a tale from 1825. It revolves around a group of Norwegian prisoners who managed to immigrate to America, braving a crazy ass storm and facing persecution all along this way. In episode one, it commences in 2010, ushering us into the world of our central figures, Apollo and Emma, within the confines of a local library that is located in Queens, New York. Now, you know that the Don Tony Teflon was born and raised in Queens, New York, so you know that this was special for me when I seen that the show was actually shot and was about Queens, New York. Apollo is an avid reader. Emma is the head librarian. So you would think that this would make them the perfect couple. And then after seeing the way Emma handles a bum who wants to go to the bathroom, this is what raises his arousal, should I say, of Emma, prompting his pursuit and trying to persuade her to go out with him over and over and over again. She shoots him down mercilessly and then the sixth time, she finally agrees to go out on a date with him. During a meal at a nearby Chinese restaurant, Apollo asks about Emma's background, uncovering that she was orphaned at the tender age of five and subsequently adopted by her elder sister. Emma then asks Apollo about his past and he evades the question, which leads us into a tale of his mother's experiences during the 1968 garbage strike. A backstory unfolds revealing how Lillian, who was Apollo's mother, tragically loses her brother at the hands of local police or attempting to flee their town. We also see that the pursuit of his mother is almost identical to the pursuit of Apollo and his lady. How she didn't want him at first because he cost her a job and then eventually he just kept pursuing her until she eventually gave in to him. They went to a Rocky movie and after giving birth to a son, he wanted to name him Rocky, but she said that wouldn't be appropriate for a little black boy. How about Apollo? And this is how Apollo gets his name. Before Emma got into this relationship with Apollo, she already planned to relocate to Brazil, a fact that she does disclose when he broaches the subject of advancing their relationship towards marriage and maybe even family. Eventually, he drops her off at the airport, triggering reoccurring nightmares of abandonment by his father. Now, in these nightmares, which are crucial to the plot of this show, Apollo often sees his father shrouded in a mysterious mask that emits a blue-colored gas from his mouth and he is forcibly separating him from his mother. Later, we see Apollo attend a local auction and acquires a collection of vintage books. While pursuing them at home, he stumbles upon a letter or is hidden within the pages of one of them. The book that it was hidden in was titled Witches Still Live and it was signed by the writer Alistair Crowley. Now, this discovery hints at the story's burgeoning fascination with the occult and witches, as we'll see as the story goes out. Initially, elated at the prospect of selling the letter for a good amount of money, Apollo excitement does go away after he realizes he lacks someone to share this news with. Meanwhile, Emma's journey takes her to a lagoon. Despite being warned about going there, she encounters an elderly sorceress who ties a red thread around her wrist, instructing her to make three wishes and never sever the thread, which it appears that she does make these wishes before she runs away. Now, upon returning to Queens, Emma arranges to meet Apollo at the airport, trying to get what they had back. She sees him sleeping on the bench. She wakes him up. He's ecstatic to see her. While eating, she then recounts her encounter with this sorceress to Apollo. And this prompts Apollo to cut the red thread with a pocket knife, asserting that their togetherness will ensure that all of her wishes come true. Apollo then marries Emma and eventually become expecting parents. We then get a flashback into Apollo's childhood and we hear some haunting sounds of his father 
voice and knocking at a door. This time, when he answers the door, he discovers a box labeled Improbabilia that once belonged to his father. Now, among the contents in this box are Apollo's birth records, a hotel receipt, and a book titled To the Waters and the Wild, which may play a role in what's shaping his life. After this flashback, we see Apollo and Emma, who is ready to bust with this baby, meeting her friend Michelle for dinner at a very upscale restaurant. Apollo is concerned about the price of all this food. Now, during their conversation, Michelle expresses concern about the risk of Emma's plan at home childbirth. When Emma excuses herself from the restroom, Michelle reveals to Apollo that the existence of a new photograph of Emma displayed in a gallery in Norway exists. This ties into the Norwegians who are escaping from the first thing that we've seen in this show. She also says that she looks like a sorceress in this picture. She then brings up the three wishes and she says that they are a good husband, a healthy child, and a mysterious adventure to Salvador. So this adventure happened when Emmer encountered a Norwegian photographer in Brazil and during her visit to a factory decides herself to capture a self-portrait using the timer on the camera and then she decides to make this a nude shot. And this is the photograph which is purchased by the gallery owner and put on exhibition, the one that she says makes Emma look like a sorceress. Now before Michelle can go into it further, Emma's water breaks and the two women then hastily depart from the restaurant. Stuck in traffic, they opt to go into a subway, determined to proceed with this at home childbirth. However, the journey takes a turn when the train halts due to a power outage and which appears to happen after she lets out one of these bone chilling screams. Now, there were a bunch of dancers on this train before and they help him deliver this baby because there's no other choice but them to do it. They block the windows and as she's giving birth, Apollo then looks up and he sees graffiti on the train and it says how a person suffers when he doesn't understand anything he believes in. Emma then eventually gives birth to a baby, and they name this baby Brian. In episode 2, over a year and a half has elapsed since the birth of their son Brian, but Emma's mental state has been deteriorating. In the scene, we find her wandering aimlessly along the nearby street while her sister Kim is in town to accompany both Emma and the baby to a medical checkup. Emma unexpectedly strays into a nearby building where a mysterious woman hands her a bag of chains, causing deep concern for Kim. The story then shoots us back in time, illustrating the challenges that Emma and Apollo have encountered since the arrival of Brian. Despite the support of Apollo's mother and Emma's sister, this couple still finds themselves in need of medical insurance, prompting Emma to return to her job. Meanwhile, Apollo lacking a stable job, as Apollo on the pursuit of collecting rare books. Now, with the assistance of his friend Patrice, Apollo explores unclaimed properties, leading to a remarkable discovery, a rare first edition of To Kill a Mockingbird, signed by Harper Lee, who was known for her reluctance to sign books which belong to Truman Capote. This is without a shadow of a doubt, a one of a kind find and a huge score, which he has to share with Emma immediately. Emma then starts to get some type of Snapchats and when she does, these photos then vanish after she sees them. She also becomes convinced that someone is watching their child though it may be attributed to her heightened maternal concerns. Emma returns to work. All of her people are happy to see her, but the exhaustion and potential postpartum depression begins to take a toll. She experiences forgetfulness, referring to Brian as the baby. Unable to comprehend her growing paranoia, Emma spirals into a distressing cycle of disconnect and emotional turmoil. She searches online forums in a desperate attempt to make sense of her feelings, but finds herself harboring a disturbing resentment towards her own child. Now, this could be from her childhood trauma. Gradually, a rift starts to emerge between Apollo and Emma. Listen, everything can't be all sugar and spice. Emma is then told she needs to get her mental health together and she starts taking medication, but this only makes her hallucinations and paranoia 
feelings worse. And then we end the flashback and return to the present. Emma accepts a chain from this woman. Kim insists that Emma seek professional help due to a evident deterioration. Kim also suspects that Emma's decline may be linked to a suppressed memory that occasionally reserves it. She eventually reveals that their mother had set their house on fire, resulting in their father's death. The sisters narrowly escaped and were placed in foster care until Kim reached the age of 18. The episode ends with beef between these two when Emma decides to have Brian baptized at a local church without consulting Apollo. In the final sequence, we witness Apollo's rare loss of composure as he confronts Emma. And at this time, the show tries to convey the message that some type of dark force may have awakened inside of her. And it seems that they want to hurt Brian for some reason. Now in episodes 3, we dive deeper into the horror aspects of this show. It opens and Emma seems like entranced, like she's really detached from reality, fixated on harming their child. Chained and bloodied, Apollo pleads with Emma to spare the baby, but with no mercy, she wields this hammer and just inflicts further brutality upon him. The story then jumps ahead a few months later when we see Apollo released from prison and is returned to Queens. It seems that much has transformed since his departure, leaving Apollo disheartened. Fabian, the janitor, then tells him that his mother has an apartment, inviting him to stay there temporarily. Now, this flashback might be the most important one that we get so far in this story. It shows Apollo's mom worked at a law firm. And during this time, she drew the attention of her boss, which she did not want anything to do with. Now, because he was shot down, he gets upset and he forces her to work on Saturdays. And this is the day that she doesn't have any childcare. So she has no choice because she needs the money to leave Apollo while he was mad young home alone. After this, we see Apollo attending a support group, and then we get the answers to why Apollo was incarcerated. He says that after their baby's death and Emma's sudden disappearance, he was consumed by anguish and a quest for answers. Armed with a shotgun, he stormed the library where Emma had worked demanding information from her co-workers. Frustrated by that silence, he fired a shot through the window which gets him bagged up. And the only reason he didn't get a harsher sentence was because the people at the library, you know, they empathized with him because of the situation and his mom has all those connections to those lawyers. Apollo then goes back to his apartment, but while he is there, he is played once again by all these reoccurring nightmares. Now, in order to try to beat this, he goes to Patrice's home. And when he does, he offers her the book, a very valuable book, and says that he doesn't want any money out of it. Apollo then tries to return home, and when he does, he encounters his mother, who seems to be spying on him during all of his low moments. When she attempts to talk to him, he doesn't really want to talk to her at the time, and then he tries to go to bed for the night. Later, Apollo revisits a room where the traumatic incident occurs and engages in a candid conversation with his mother. He tells her that once Brian was born, that's when all these nightmares started to come back. And then she says that these are not nightmares. These are real things that happened during the cartoon days, which she would call them because she would have him sit and watch Saturday morning cartoons on the TV while she would go off to work. She then tells him that his pops wanted to stay, but it was her that filed for a divorce because it was just unstable. Now, Apollo had thought his whole life that his father abandoned him. But at this time, he realizes that that wasn't the case and it was his mother that broke off the marriage and this makes him extremely upset. The next day, Apollo does attend the local church where Emma arranged the baptism for Brian. Now, his purpose of going there is to get a signature for his parole documents, but the priest insists on a meeting before fulfilling this request. During the meeting, a woman shares a story that is exactly the same as Apollo and Emma. She describes receiving mysterious messages from an unknown number, messages that would vanish, causing her great distress. These messages consisted of distant photographs of her daughter, but when she tried to confine it to her husband, her husband dismissed the concern and said that he, she was just delusional. 
Uh, the woman displays the sole photographic evidence that she managed to capture during these incidents. And it's at this time that she reveals that it wasn't her child in the picture. And this is why she went out and sought help from other mothers, which led her to Cal, the group leader of the Wise Ones. After hearing all this, Apollo gets mad. He walks out. He thinks that this woman is the cause of the problems for her own children. While he walks away, a guy runs up on him and says that Patrice sent him, expresses interest in the book Apollo has been attempting to sell. They eventually sit down for coffee, and when Apollo notices a video recording on the man's phone related to the woman at the church, the name, the wise one, stands out. A quick internet search reveals that the phrase is associated with witches so after these three episodes what do we know we know that emma's disappearance the three witches her encounter with the witch in brazil all have led to brian's so-called demise and also we know that the photograph of her that is being displayed in no way of a sorceress has something to do with all of these witches that he just searched up and most likely that Emma's paranoia, the mysterious text messages, and all these events most likely are linked to the group, the wise ones, which have a prophecy saying that they must sacrifice a child for the betterment of the world. At least that's what I'm thinking is going on right now. In fact, I think I might have this whole thing figured out and I'll drop that in a full spoiler video and give you my theories and everything else like that. So make sure that you subscribe, click that bell so you can be notified every time I drop a new video and you know who it is. Peace, stay sexy.